What is Faustian man's unique struggle? What is Faustian man's test in the modern age? We're going to talk about that and divination and how that can help be a first step for Faustian man to possibly step outside of the intellect that he is. And instead of being in the endless loop of the eternal return of the same, spiral inwards or spiral up. With Faust, what he's offered by Mephistopheles is everything. He faces the same archetypal struggle as Job did, but it's different. It's almost opposite. Job's test was misfortune and the negation of all the joy in his life, the worldly joy. Because the test of Job is, can he make him curse God? Can he make him give God up? Faustian man suffers the opposite of this very temptation. Mephistopheles is given mastery over all worldly things and desires, and to provide that to Faust or Faustian man, can the satisfaction of all worldly desires, of the convenience and all the magic that Mephistopheles gives him, can that sedate him below what he is? Can that remove or distract him from his desire from the absolute? Because what Faustian man has is actually, and European man has, is the strongest connection to the divine. That's the eye push. That's why all the inventions came from us, because that is divine inspiration. It's only after it reaches here is it becomes will to power. The struggle is going to be and get worse and worse. Matches up well with the apocalypse, homo provoked a homo logos. Who will be the provoked beings that are just proddings of desire, a machinic desire, and the satisfaction of that desire in the worldly? And who will look inward? And so what happens to Faustian man is he looks all the world over, whether it be trying to take rockets to Mars, dosing on ketamine, whether it be looking for the eternal feminine in every woman in romantic love, so not finding it there. And so this is the test. It's the worldly desires and their satisfaction. As more and more of them, more and more techniques and sorcery grows, the greater is the test for Faustian man. Who among us can become initiates in this age? Who can step away from the world and the devil's lusts and what he tempts us with? Because that's what Mephistopheles is. That's what the convenience of the device and the mechanism is and the enframing. It's the sorcerous imprisonment in the satisfaction of devise, desires, but still within the frame of the intellect. And so what is the first step for Faustian man as a way out? Really, this is the nihilism of modernism. There is something still missing. Does he become an active nihilist and just chase after as Homer provoked, chase after this either will to power or lust, hedonistic lust. That's the choice that most people go or people go with the, with the with that. There are some though of Faustian man of the spirit that won't ever be satisfied. The ones that reject the temptation. I don't know. For me, it was always the case, whether it be World of Warcraft and all the fake worlds that they create. It, it's never enough. But you even see this in even people who succumb to it. You still see within them. They know deep down it's not satisfied. He goes from goal to goal. Even our greatest billionaires are still dissatisfied, aren't they? They still have to dose on ketamine. Because deep down is the hunger for the absolute. The, the, the test of Mephistopheles. Well, most people will go through life without ever uh, going to the ground of that desire. They won't look towards the ground of their being which is the Logos in the final analysis through the self of the will to power, deeper, deeper still to find love and the God, the uncreated God and Jesus Christ, his son. So how can divination be a first step out? Well, divination, Faustian man's challenge is to first awaken out of the interpretation that is intellect. 
But let's just to break out on the modern frame before the people that might be watching saying, oh, isn't this, this is nonsense or whatnot. Let's just look at a few people. Carl Jung, a very rigorous empiricist and in his uh, psychic, uh, psychological investigations, always very careful, yet attested to the power of this divination system and the book. And he did this, the, uh, a causal connecting principle, the work he did with Wolfgang Pauli. Then there's Bernardo Katzstrop, who is a very rigorous philosopher and was a CERN computer scientist. He talks about this too and how it is very uh, legitimate, this divination using the I Ching. Well, even he's talked about divination in general. Then just as a breakout of, of some scientific evidence that we can use just to parallel phenomena, I'm not saying this proves it, because it is a, per a personal proof anyway. It doesn't lend itself to scientific investi investigation because if you come in with skepticism, it won't provide proofs for you because the divine doesn't give a crap about your experiment. But if you come in with the right frame, the divine will, uh, with real questions that, that uh, you know, need a result and help with, then of course you have the proofs for you well above chance, well above just random coincidence, which again... And Nick Land, Nick Land, we spoke about that. Miracles of coincidence. So the scientific evidence that's parallel to this is the all the parapsychological uh, data that was put together in a meta-study on nature. I'll put a link below in the description. Just as an example of something that they did a meta-study, it was published in Nature, right? One of the most prestigious journals in science. And it proves that um, parapsychological phenomena occur above chance what is divination really when you're using the I Ching I won't go into the full system of it but when you're using the I Ching you are essentially mapping you're opening up an opportunity a symbolic opportunity for the outside for outside signal for the outside to communicate just like if you're looking at the world or looking at birds what whatever it is Giving uh, that opens an opportunity too for the divine to speak to you, even addressing the divine personally through your thoughts. It opens up an opportunity for miracles of coincidence to occur. So that is all the I Ching is. You're opening up a small window of of factical being to roll the coins, for instance, right for them to be a causally manipulated from outside, from the eternal. Let's say. That's not really all that much different from uh, focusing on a, on birds to see if there's a message in them or that sort of thing, right? So in itself, it's not a bad thing. It's like a tool. But what you're really doing is you're putting, you could say, you're trying to escape intellect as Faustian man. You're trying to get out of the interpretation that's given in advance to you that is making the world essence to you and presence to you in an annihilated, disinterested, dead way. You're at the zero point of world and also spirituality. You don't have either of them, really. You're just an annihilated state. Most of the man is kind of like that in active nihilism or passive nihilism. A good analogy for this is it's kind of like when they use a weight and hook a cable to it and throw it in the o into the ocean off a ship to get the depth. You're like throwing out a weight into becoming, into, into which is below the postulate that you are and the human logos that forms the interpretation that makes the world present in the way it does into deeper layers of reality. That's what you're doing by doing this and framing a question. You ask a question, then you roll out what is called a hexagram and that has interpretation. It's a means by which outside signal or you can get communication from that. So by asking your question, addressing it to the guardian angel or the Lord, but yeah, essentially, there are deeper levels of reality. And if you stare long enough at one place, you'll see them. The only true future that is available to you, that's not just a projection of next year or whatever this is, is what is becoming, but has not yet reached you and the knowledge and knowing of mankind. That's the unknown. There is an unknown that's here, an, un an objective unconscious, an objective unknown that's right here that you can't see, that you can have access to outside of human logos and that's where jesus is that's where the divine is that's where the unconscious is 
It's not just a subjective unconscious. It's also an objective unconscious. And Jung talked about this, that these are the layers of becoming I'm talking about that you throw down into with divination that can actually manipulate physical things in the postulate that you are. Your knowing of being, you know, as human being, that it's after the fact and the events that happen in being. As you stare at them, you actually move towards the future, not in terms of next year, but into becoming, not the memory, right? We're trying to escape this memory zone, this knowing of being, because everything's already disclosed. The benefits of divination are if you're in a state of intellect and you can't trust really your own moral judgment or you things aren't going well for you uh, and you don't have a spiritual advisor or a priest yet or something like that or you're on the and you're you're you are this modern you're a nihilistic modern and you're looking for an objective standpoint on where you are or something to advise you outside of the intellect that you are that has your best interests in mind if you're aimed towards the good though and if you're not lusting after some will to power desire in the world then it, it the benefit of divination is it escapes that to give you an objective signal objective advice from a moral standpoint of what to do not even just moral of what to do with anything or what will happen if you do a certain thing, what will be brought about by doing a certain action? And in the metaphysics, it's kind of assumed that there is a guiding principle behind it that is moral. Because when you ask about something, it gives you either a positive or a negative um, assessment of it. If you're after the good, that's, when you sh that's how you should use it. If you're after the lustiness, the danger of divination is it's not the dove or the miraculous uh, arcana, or the mir miraculous um, agent, that your guardian angel that communicates with you, it's the will to power and the magical agent, the serpent, which will tell you the truth, but it won't, it'll keep you in intellect. It'll keep you in going after those worldly things. So what makes divination a dangerous thing is you, is the degree to which you, you're sinful, the degree to which you keep going after those sins, if you're repenting of that and you want help to move towards the good, then what will guide you through, it, of course, is the good. What will guide you through the divination or through the palantir is not Sauron, it's God, it's, it's the Lord, it's the guardian angel or the lesser hierarchies anyway, will be the things that are giving you answers. The divine image that you had before the fall has clairvoyance to ask questions. It can transcend space and time. And so you can ask anything and it will give you answers. You could ask, and I've asked many times, different figures online, what is the nature of A? What's the nature of this person? What's the nature of that person to determine what they're like or if they're evil? And you'll get answers that are very clear. I remember I asked, like, what's the nature of the Beowulf Foundation? And it comes up with revolution, <laughs> right? It comes up with uh, molting, which is exactly what they are. So you see that's confirmed again and again and again with the trigrams that you roll with the coins from divination. But again, if it's will to power you're after, that's where you'll have a negative experience with it. And you should, uh, you, if you're after the good, you'll have a good experience. I had nothing but positive things. It's actually led me away from bad things in my initial stage. And that's another use of it is that if you are involved in initiation, involved in uh, Christian hermeticism, for instance, is that, and as Jung would also confirm, is that the archetypes can appear to you imagistically and you might not be sure what they are. You, you don't have discernment yet. Oh, is that the adversary or the, you know, the devil? Is that the will to power or is that a, you know, is that God, right? And you don't know, uh, this thing has led me away from when it was that, when the archetypes or the spirit of the depth, what Jung could calls the spirit of the depths has appeared. And you don't have the discernment yet, or you haven't read the Christian mystics and the saints on their descriptions of what these things appear, like what, what it's like when the devil appears to you. What is it? For, what's the spiritual phenomenology of it? If you don't know that yet, it was allowed me to ask the questions and realize and led me away from the adversary um, and doing the right thing in response to them. And I've, I've only ever had positive experiences leading me towards Christ, towards morality, and away from dangers. Again, it's not the I Ching that's doing it. 
it's what the agent is behind reality that's doing it. It's what your sin, it's what you part, it's to do with what your makeup is and what you're after and what you will for. If you're willing against personal will to power and trying to do the good and become more like the good, then that's the agent that's going to be helping you. You just have to be aware of that and don't be going after worldly will to power things. That it's that's when it becomes personal magic rather than being aligned with or uh, divine magic or sacred magic. Because the will to power is, in a sense, wrapped up with the intellect and the reflective intellect and the interpretation and keeping us away, away from God and having the world annihilated, that's part of the devil, the Araman, who's turning everything into will to power and techne and technology is the will to power. So everything around you is that already, right? So if you fear divination, the way you're organizing your life already is sort of sorceress in terms of your goal setting, in terms of how you operate as a modern, already is sorceress, if not worse than the divination that might help you escape from it or take the first steps out of it. How's that true? Well, I mean, psychotherapy is basically demonology. It's disconnected from uh, the priesthood and the church, and it's the manipulation of demons to try and quell them, right? To try and control them and stop you from eating. Because what causes you to do all these things? They're temptations, right? They're demonic. And so if you're after the good, it's, it'll be a great thing for you. But the idea still, though, is even if it is good, what I noticed it can do is keep you in a mode of reflectivity, asking questions and trying to get the divination to make the choice. And what God wants for you is you to make the moral choice, right? So you keep doing, and you're doing it then too much, and you spend half your day interpreting it rather than acting. So it can keep you in this reflective mode, which you're trying to escape, both in how being presence is to you and just in your general action, right? So that's a, da a danger. You only want to do it a certain amount, maybe once a week, asking what the week's going to be and what um, and what you can do and, and uh, whether a certain set of actions are recommend recommended. With work, what, what should I do regarding the live streams this week, you might say, or, you know, what should I do regarding outside of prayer? What's coming and what should I do outside of prayer? And honestly, it has saved me from so many uh, sinful behavior and also, it'll predict the future. It'll tell you what is coming because it knows it's like, like I said, it's about dropping into becoming. You can ask about the week that's coming and it'll tell you the tendencies, right, uh, that are happening. But if you're trying to awaken the magic and to get out of that Spurg mindset, this is a good first step to spiral in. But you just don't want to get trapped in the circle. Like a lot of occultists, right, Eliphas, Eliphas Levy, there were some that did ceremonial magic. And then there were others who, re who realized in the end that that just never was enough. They passed the Faustian test. They passed the Faustian test by stepping on from something that wasn't the full experience of God, that was ceremonial magic and, and wrapped up in the personal will to power or the personal magic, which is what ceremonial magic is. There are the retards like Crowley who got stuck at it, and we, we should really pity him, even though he did a lot of damage and, still, and his mindset is still doing damage is that he was uh, pushed around and provoked by his own sinful demons, is they realized and they wrote letters about it after, is that I um, wanted the full mystic experience of God. And they ended, ended up coming back to the church and clearly saying that the sacred magic of the ceremonies was far more powerful and always will be. Passing the, fa passing the Faustian test isn't just getting out of the modern mindset and realizing magic's real. It's also moving on from the divination practices or whatever they may be to the deeper and deeper experience of God, not just magic, but Gnostic and mystic. And also, so a lot of these guys pass that test and let go of ceremonial magic and let go of divinations. Jung didn't get stuck there. He began with this and then moved into and became a Christian. So for a lot of people, it can be a way out of this Faustian challenge. Like Peterson, like Viveki are a technical bridge out. But if you got stuck at them, their ideologies and their thinking, object-oriented ontology, as Dugan said, is Satanism. <laughs> You're after unlocking, disclosing the spiral towards the value of values and that's of love. And if that divination can bring you a step towards it, out of that, to realize 
the very beginnings of the magic of the world, then it's a good thing if that's what you're trying to do. And I can only recommend it.